Well, for the last couple of weeks, we've been on this series that I've been titling something along the lines of get everything that you want, uh, how to get everything when you can afford nothing, something along those lines. Because the idea is, so many times around Christmas time, we get ourselves stressed with this whole gift giving and gift receiving situation. We begin to think about all the things we would want if we were going to buy them for ourselves, and then we tell each other that we want them, and then when they don't buy them for us, then we go out and buy them ourselves. And so that's the way Christmas tends to work. But what happens is, as we're doing that, we realize that we're limited. And so, even though I might want a new car, I'm not going to ask you for, for, for a, a really expensive car, like a Porsche or Ferrari or something. I'm going to ask you for a Hyundai, because I know that you're limited. But if you don't give me that Hyundai, then of course we've got another thing that we've got to deal with. But the point is that we have these great big desires that we purposefully reduce because we understand our limits, and so then we only ask for the things that we think are accessible. And the way it usually works in our world is that I want peace. And so what I do is I choose to purchase a gift that I hope is going to placate someone that I love whom I've recently hurt, but if I get them the right gift, maybe they'll forgive me and then we have peace. It's not because I really think they need that present, it's because I want peace. Or maybe I want joy or, or something like that. And so what I do is I lower my standards to something that's accessible, something that I can acquire, and then I shoot for that. So for this Christmas season, I want to ask you to shoot for the moon, to go be beyond the things that money limits you to, to go beyond the things that certain relationship problems might limit you to, and to go all the way for the things your heart really wants, because those are things where money cannot even come into the equation. And so if you can't afford to buy someone a fancy present, that's cool, because you can't afford to buy them what you really want to give them anyway. You have to offer that to them in some other fashion. So for the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about these characteristics. We've been talking about peace and how Jesus came to bring us peace. And then last week, joy. Jesus came to bring us joy. We talked about things like that. And today, we're moving on to the one that all of us want, and it's love. We're going to be talking about what Jesus does to bring us love at Christmas time. And you can't buy love, and you can look for love in all the wrong places, but Jesus says you can have it for free. And so today, I'm going to take you to one of the most, in fact, probably the most famous of all the Christmas stories. It's Jonah and, and the whale. Well, not really a whale, but a fish. If you, you know, read the Bible, it's a, it's a fish. And, and it's one of the most famous stories of all time. And since I'm appropriating it for Christmas, I'm just going to call it the most famous Christmas story of all time. And, and, and I know you're looking at me with blank faces. We're going to get there in just a little bit. We're going we're gonna to look at the story of Jesus and his love for us through the lens of Jonah, and I think it might come clear by the time we're all done. But we're going to start in Luke chapter 11. On the Bibles we passed out, it's page 722, so I invite you to go there so that we're all on the same page. Luke 11:27 is where we're starting. So when you begin in verse 27, we're following up a story of Jesus uh, interacting with some people. He's casting out demons. They're accusing him of casting out demons by the power of Satan himself. And Jesus is like, no, that's not the way it works. But when we get to verse 27, we see this. As Jesus was saying these things, a woman in the crowd called out, blessed is the mother who gave birth and nursed you. There's the Christmas story right there. Jesus' birth. That's, that's where it comes in. So we're already a little bit Christmassy. But that's about as far as we're going to go today, because the rest of this is going to focus on why Jesus came. So this woman says, blessed is the mother who gave birth to you and nursed you. And that's sort of what we do. Man, wouldn't it be great to be in Jesus's family or to be like near him? Wouldn't it have been awesome to have him be born in some type of stable in southern Tippecanoe County? that we could have, like, driven down there and, like, hung out with him for a little while? Wouldn't that have been cool to see the baby that's going to save the world and then to grow up to get to know him? Wouldn't that have been cool to have that close, personal bond with him? And wouldn't it have been even better to be in his physical family? One of his half-brothers, one of his half-sisters, or maybe even his mom. Wouldn't that have been such an honor? And so this woman says, blessed is the woman who gave birth to you. And Jesus doesn't go there. Look what he says. He, he says, he replied, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Blessed rather are those who hear the words of God and obey it. 
what Jesus does here is he flips. He, he flips upside down this woman's notion of what it means to have blessing in your life. See, she's got this idea that the woman in this world who is truly blessed is the one who had the freedom or the, or the privilege to be the mother of Jesus. That's what she thinks. She thinks that's a woman who's truly blessed, which if you read between the lines, you can hear her with an aching heart say, Jesus, I wish I had a son like you. You can hear her saying things like, man, I wish I knew you the way she must know you. And Jesus doesn't go there. He's not going to put up with this notion that because he shares a little bit of DNA with some other person, he's not going to put up with the notion that that somehow makes that other person more blessed than anyone else. And so, he says, no, the person who obeys God. I don't know if you're keeping notes, but if you are keeping notes, one of the things you need to jot down is this concept. This concept that it's, for Jesus, obedience is more important than blood. Obedience is more important than blood. Just because he's got some type of DNA relationship with Mary does not mean anything with regard to whether or not she has a closer standing with God than you or anyone else. And this is important. We're going to come back to it in just a little bit, but this sort of sets up uh, a stage for what we're going to read next. And it's not going to make sense, but, you know, just go with me. We'll eventually figure this one out as we go through it. So here we go, verse 29. As the crowds increased, Jesus said, this is a wicked generation. <laughs> now, that's just a great way to start a sermon. You know, by the way, I'm getting a lot of crowds. By the way, y'all are sinners. Y'all wicked, and you're messed up. Okay, that's what Jesus says. Um, this is a wicked generation. It asks for a miraculous sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. Okay. For as Jonah was assigned to the Ninevites, so also will, be, will the Son of Man be to this generation. I was a kid, and I went to a Christian school, and my dad was a pastor, so I heard verses all the time, and I heard the nice fluffy verses, the verses that everybody memorizes. You know, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. You know, that's a good fluffy verse. God loves us. And so he sent Jesus so that we could have eternal life. That's, a, that's an easy one to grasp, but, but because I had so much Bible education, I also heard the weird verses, and this was one of them, where Jesus says, this is a wicked generation, you want a miracle, but the only sign I'm going to give you is Jonah. I was like, I never understood what that meant. And to be honest with you, I don't think I understood until this last week what that verse really meant.